and welcome to another episode of Hank Unplugged. This is another forum that the Christian Research Institute has come up with to augment our broadcasts. The podcast, and I've explained this on past podcasts, is less didactic, it's less leaning forward, it's much more dialogue-based. It's out of the studio and into the study, as it were, as I talk to friends, some of the brightest minds on the planet, about some of the most significant issues that we're grappling with. And this particularly in an age of scientific enlightenment. And in that vein, I wanted to have a conversation with Dr. Michael Behe. He is a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He's a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. And I think more to the point for this discussion and many other discussions, he's the author of Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution, and, and the and is very important here, a DVD that we are going to be promoting on a regular basis on the Bible Answer Man broadcast and through our social media venues. This is one of those must-have videos for everyone. I'm not just talking about everyone in the Christian community, the Catholic community, the Orthodox community, the Protestant community. I'm talking about everyone needs to watch this video. First of all, it's captivating. Secondly, you are going to be introduced to something that dazzles your mind. You think about the fact that we live in a universe in which there are trillions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. And that's on a macro level. But what Mike Behe does on a microscopic level, as it were, is equally intriguing. And it shows, ultimately, that there is a designer behind this universe. We would never suppose that we can have design without a designer. And I love what Michael Behe pointed out in Darwin's Black Box when he said what happens when a photon of light hits a human eye was beyond 19th century science. And therefore, to Darwin, vision was simply an unopened black box. However, in the 20th century, that black box of vision has been opened and is no longer enough to consider the anatomical structure of the eye, we now know that each of the anatomical steps, each of the structures that Darwin thought were so simple actually involve, and and, and I think this is the perfect word for staggeringly complicated biochemical processes that demand an explanation. At any rate, I could go on and on about this DVD, but it's one of those things you can't believe it until you see it. So this DVD, if you can't get it in any other place, you can get it through Equip.org, and we make it available to people who support the ministry. So if you support the ministry, we will send you the video. I've often talked about a dogma that was virtually unheard of before the 19th century. And then, of course, within... A few years, it morphed from its humble beginnings in the British Isles into a worldwide phenomenon. And then you have millions extolling its virtues with unbending devotion and, I would say, with evangelistic fervor as well. What happens by the 20th century is amazing. Its cardinal doctrines now permeate bastions of education They penetrate corridors of influence and power. And then you have the masters of mass communication championing its tenants and academic institutions churning out its messengers. Its proponents consider themselves keepers of orthodoxy, and they will react with cult-like fanaticism when their presuppositions are questioned, which is precisely 
what Mike Behe did. They began questioning the presuppositions, and that's why revolutionary, and this is the title of the DVD, is so appropriate. He upended the cart. He turned it over. He wasn't, and we're going to talk about this in a few moments, but I don't think he was designing some kind of a revolution. But when he started questioning some of the basic tenets of Neo-Darwinianism, well, the cart flipped over and he found himself in the position of being a revolutionary. The DVD, again, available through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. You can check it out on the web at equip.org. It is my distinct honor and pleasure now to introduce Mike Behe to this podcast. Mike, it is great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Hank. It's great to be able to, to talk with you for an hour. We have some things in common. We both have nine natural children. I think that I kind of topped you a little bit by adopting three children, so I got up to 12 and you're still at nine. Yeah, we're happy to let you have the lead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, look, you're a revolutionary, but you didn't mean to be. Yeah, no, I, I was just, uh, I'm, I'm actually a biochemist is what I like to think of myself as. I, I studied biochemistry, which is just the chemistry of living things. Uh, most people don't give much thought to it, of course. And one of the things that you study is really complicated systems that undergird life. And circumstances caused me to start doubting Darwin's explanation. And so I formulated an argument to show what I think was a better explanation, and that was that, in fact, believe it or not, most living things, most living systems, particularly at the molecular level where biochemistry studies, uh, required design. They, they needed someone to direct how they were put together, to plan it, uh, so that they just uh, function. Uh, so I was just trying to get across a pretty simple point, I thought. And now you got across the simple point, and there's this great pushback to you, not only as a professor, but a person. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I was listening uh, to your introduction and thinking that you know, I upset the uh, apple cart, and, and the apple cart fell on me, and all the apples uh, <laughs> smacked all over me. Uh, when I wrote the book, I was just hoping that you know some people would notice it, so that those working in the field would be, you know, apprised of the arguments. But it turns out that the question of random evolution—that is, evolution without direction or purpose versus design—is really a uh, fundamental one, and it cuts across a lot of people's uh, views of themselves and how the world works, and they people can get pretty emotional about um, views they hear that don't agree with their own. And, and I kind of found that out uh, <laughs> in later years. It's kind of interesting. I remember early on in my career, in the late 80s, I was writing a book called Christianity in Crisis. And at that time, I didn't have much notoriety. Not many people knew who I was. That book went on to sell millions of copies around the world, and it created a revolution in its own field. But whenever you do something like that, there's enormous pushback. And I mention that only because that's what happened with you. When you wrote Darwin's Black Box, you did not know what was going to unfold on the world stage. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, like I said, I was pretty naive. All I wanted to do was kind of get my personal argument out and uh, hope that a, you know, a few people beyond my mom and dad read the book. Uh, but it, it, it attracted some attention, and uh, I was <laughs> startled to find out that there was a lot of 
uh, emotion attached to it. But I guess, as you say, uh, you know, if, if it's a revolution, you know, revolutions are opposed, and there's the old guard that uh, doesn't want uh, things to change, and so they are oftentimes very vigorous in their pushing back. What's interesting is the title of the book that created the revolution, Darwin's Black Box. I mean, the title is intriguing on a lot of different levels. And you not only say that there was a black box that got open, but you're pointing out that as science advances, more and more of these black boxes are being opened and they reveal, and I sort of alluded to this at the beginning of the broadcast, they reveal this unanticipated Lilliputian world of enormous complexity that has pushed the theory of evolution beyond the breaking point. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, and uh, it, it's really uh, kind of ironic uh, when I think about it that you know ordinarily people say, well, the advance of science is putting behind uh, any need for anything outside of nature as an explanation for it, but it, it's the opposite. You know, uh, back in uh, Darwin's day, everything seemed to be pretty simple, but the more and more science has investigated life and the cosmos as well, the more and more and more we see things that are kind of balanced on a knife edge uh, and really elegant systems that uh, defy uh, natural explanations or explanations in terms of simple natural laws. And that, and that applies in spades to life. You know, people forget that back in Darwin's day, uh, nobody really knew what the cell was. We now know it's the fundamental unit of life, but it seemed just like, well, they called it protoplasm, you know, essentially a glob of jelly, and they thought it was pretty simple. So it was pretty easy for Darwin and his contemporaries, uh, who didn't know anything about it, to just imagine, well, this might kind of transform itself into anything, uh, for all we know. And it was only with the advance of science when molecules were discovered. You know, in Darwin's day, molecules were kind of theoretical. Nobody even knew whether they existed or not. And it was only then with the kind of painful work of elucidating the foundation of life that uh, science discovered molecules and molecular machines and DNA storing information and uh, all sorts of control systems that are required to turn things on and turn things off at the at the right time. And so, yeah, it's the, it's the very progress of science itself that gives us a, you know, really uh, insight into how, uh, you know, uh, wondrously made we are. Uh, better than, than uh, most people throughout history have had. You think about some of the illustrations that you have used. In the past, you used the illustration of a mouse trap. In Revolutionary, you talk about the flagellum. But in both cases, you're talking about something fairly simple for the average person to understand. And I think perhaps therein lies the danger if you make this relatable to people, if they can think of a flagellum as an outboard motor, all of a sudden they have a context. They say, wow, yeah, I never thought about that before. But when it's shrouded in the complicated terms of science, people simply swallow the message without thinking about it critically. That, that's right. They, they feel intimidated, really, that, well, these scientists know a lot more than I do about this stuff, and they're all saying that, oh, it just came about by accident, and, you know, who am I? I don't have the uh, equipment to, uh, to push back on, on that, even though, you know, it, it's crazy. You know, I look around and see all the wonderful things in, in nature, in life, you know, birds, fly and fish swim and, and so on, it, it seems ridiculous, but uh, I, don't, I don't know how to, to push back. But it turns out that a lot of the concepts, if not the details, a lot of the concepts that are really kind of critical are pretty simple. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, I illustrated one of them with uh, a mouse trap in, in my first book, Darwin's Black Box. And uh, the 
point of the mousetrap example is that there is a big um, logical obstacle, or, or at least physical obstacle, to Darwin's proposed mechanism of evolution, which is random uh, mutations, random changes, and natural selection. Darwin proposed that, you know, every now and again, uh, some change happens in an organism, and it uh, maybe it will improve it a little bit. And if it improves it a little bit, then uh, that organism uh, will give rise to uh, progeny. And if the progeny have that slight improvement, then they'll have a better chance of surviving. And and lo, their uh, their own progeny then will do the same thing. And and that's pretty much what built everything in uh, in life. And yet. If the uh, small change has to improve something, and it's very hard to see how it can improve something or begin to build something that requires many steps before it, it's doing anything useful, before it's functioning. And uh, if you think of a mouse trap, you know, uh, a normal mechanical mouse trap you might buy at a hardware store. There's a kind of a wooden platform and a spring and a hammer, a little metal hammer it's called, and a couple other metal pieces. And it turns out that pretty much all of them are required for the thing to be uh, to be uh, working. If you take away the spring or if you take away the wooden platform or the the hammer that hits the mouse, it turns out the whole thing is broken. So it's very hard to see how you can approach something like that gradually. And the kicker is that there's lots and lots of things in life that have that property, which I called irreducible complexity. They're complex, they have a number of parts, and you can't reduce them in the sense that you can't take a part out without having the whole thing fail. And looked at the other way, it, you can't get the working machine or working system uh, just by one part and then add one more part and another one. Now you've got to have the whole thing at once. Essentially, you've got to have the whole thing there before natural selection can even act to select it. So that that was a big problem uh, from the get-go with, with Darwin's theory. I thought what was really interesting is after you came out with that argument, there were these absolutely, well, way out attempts to explain away your argument. So the argument of the mousetrap became very, very complicated after a while because you start reading the arguments that supposedly take that and render it obsolete, and you get confused in those arguments. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, so, it, yeah, after the book came out, there was kind of a, an Internet cottage industry in trying to build mousetraps from... <laughs> smaller pieces, and uh, a number of them, uh, almost all of them pretty much, uh, used the designer, the guy trying to uh, see how a mouse cap could be uh, put together, used his intelligence to direct uh, the construction of the mouse trap, and then went back and said, this is what natural selection would have done. Well, no. <laughs> uh, it turns out that Darwin's claim was a radical one. He didn't say that things could be put together uh, gradually under the direction of an intelligent agent. He said they would be put together gradually um, by uh, a random process, something without any intelligence whatsoever. And to this day, you know, the book came out in 1996, and to this day, um, there has not been a uh, what I consider to be a uh, a first step towards explaining something uh, like a mousetrap by a random uh, change and, and selection process. And, you know, mousetrap is irreducibly complex, but it's it's pretty simple as machinery goes. You know, compare that to a, you know, uh, uh, a radio or to a computer or, or to an outboard motor. Um, and uh, it's pretty simple. And yet, uh, that stumps people right off the bat. So it actually is, is nice because people who really didn't like the idea of intelligent design and irreducible complexity, including a, a whole lot of smart people, uh, did their best to try to falsify it. And, uh, of course, you'll get different opinions, but in my very considered opinion, they utterly failed to do so. 
and it's been decades uh, since then. So that that just shows you how uh, how weak of a, a theory Darwin's uh, really is. Do you think that there's ever going to be a time where this theory collapses completely? For example, I think a Dr. David Berlinski, who satirized Darwin's theory of evolution as the last of the great 19th century mystery religions, and he said, as we speak, it is now following Freudianism and Marxism into the nether regions, and I'm quite sure that Freud and Marx and Darwin are commiserating one with another in the dark dungeon where discarded gods gather. <laughs> so it's kind of delicious wow. language, but wow. but uh, do you think there'll ever come a time where the house of cards collapses? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. It'll. I think it'll take a, you know, at least a generation of students uh, studying and growing up and coming of age in an atmosphere where other possibilities are thought about and real good physical scientific objections are advanced against it, and they're really irrefutable. I mean, uh, the most common objection to criticisms of Darwinism is, uh, well, yeah, sure, just wait another 10 years and then we'll show you. Uh, But 20 years have come and gone since... Darwin's black box, and still, you know, pretty much none of the objections have been uh, even steps made on the path to answering them. But you know, so I, I think when you know more and more criticisms come, and and there's actually criticisms of Darwin's theory, even from uh, people who aren't supporters of intelligent design, they just they're looking for another, you know, unintelligent theory, so to speak, uh, uh, that only involves physical forces and, and other things. But they are very critical of Darwin's because they see there's stuff uh, that we're discovering about life that it, it just doesn't fit. And um, the idea of intelligent design, uh, which I support, has only, it only grows stronger as science progresses. You know, back in Darwin's day, it wasn't, you know, uh, it was easy to believe that something like Darwin's theory could really turn out to be true. And then we discovered proteins and DNA and the genetic code and uh, translation and transcription and and molecular motors and, and all sorts of stuff. And that's continuing. It's It's not slowing down. More and more uh, really elegant and sophisticated systems are being found in the cell. And and that, I think, the very progress of science, the increase in knowledge, will be what knocks Darwin's theory out eventually, at you, least for its grand claims, yeah, you, simple claims. Yeah, you've been pretty even-handed about all of this. I remember you writing something to the effect that Although Darwin's mechanism, natural selection, working on variation may explain some things or even many things, it doesn't explain molecular life. You also are, as a Christian, in the category of an old earth creationist, which means that you're not only saying that a person needs to do science well, but a person needs to learn the Bible or learn to read the Bible in the sense in which it's intended. The Bible's really not intended to teach us how old the universe is. If you want to find that out, you have to look for God's imprimatur on the universe that he has created. So it seems to me that you've been very balanced, but even though you've been balanced, you have received criticism that's almost unthinkable at some points. Yeah, well, you start to grow a thicker hide once you you do this. I'm sure you know about that. Um, but, um, yeah, well, it, you have to kind of be careful. Uh, it, it's kind of like Darwin's theory says that, well, random changes plus selection uh, can, you know, build life. And you say to yourself, well, I, I can see that random changes plus selection could do something, but not build life. It, it's kind of like saying I can throw a pair of die and get double sixes and win, you know, some prize or other. Yeah, okay, that can happen, sure, Every once every 36 times or so. Then somebody says, I can throw a thousand die and get all of them sixes, and that explains, you know, something or other. 
you say, well, I tend to doubt that. <laughs> uh, so it's important to, to say that, you know, there are accidents in the world. There's uh, some degree of randomness. And, and by luck, sometimes uh, it can do a bit of good. And, and in biology, I think one good illustration is, say, the sickle hemoglobin gelation, the, the mutation behind sickle cell disease. And it's got a uh, bad reputation, deservedly, of course, but uh, in Africa, where malaria kills uh, you know, a million children per year, it does some good because if a person has just one copy of the sickle gene, then that affords a bit of resistance to malaria. And it's interesting, most people think that's pretty, pretty impressive, but if you uh, look at the molecular level, there's one tiny change in one uh, really impressive machine called hemoglobin, which carries oxygen. Uh, it, it's kind of like denting the fender on your car, and uh, for some reason that, that helps your car do something. And the, it causes the hemoglobin to stick to each other, the many hemoglobin molecules in a cell, and form kind of a gel, which pushes the cell into a sickle shape. And somehow, somewhere, that, that kills the malarial parasite, or it leads to its death. Uh, so I think random changes could do that, because that is probably about a one in a hundred million odds against chance. And there have been that many people born in Africa, you know, uh, over history. So there's no reason to doubt that something like that could happen. But that's just this tiny change in a, in a pre-existing system. And it's also interesting, since I'm um, talking about malaria, is that there's a handful of other mutations in the human genome that help people survive in malarious regions. And the other five are pretty much all mutations that break pre-existing genes. There's a couple mutations that lead to something called thalassemia, which break a gene for the alpha chain of hemoglobin. Let's not worry about what that is, versus the beta chain of hemoglobin. Something that breaks an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, and let's not worry about that either. Uh, but the point is that this is evolution by degradation or devolution. It's, it's not building the sophisticated machinery of, of life. It's breaking it down. And Darwin's theory is a wonderful explanation for how to break a gene. And maybe in some circumstances that will, will help a person survive like it does uh, in the presence of malaria. But it does not explain how elegant machinery arose in the first place. You know, one of the things I loved about revolutionary is that it, it really gets into this issue of intelligent design. And one of the illustrations was Scott Minnick, who's a microbiology professor at the University of Idaho. And he was in Iraq working for an Iraq survey group. He was looking for biological and chemical weapons on behalf of the U.S. government. And he wrote a paper co-authored with Stephen Meyer arguing that the flagellum is best explained by intelligent design. But then he was unsure as to whether or not he should publish the article, because if he published the article, it might be the end of his career. And in the DVD, it's a fascinating story. The mortar rounds are coming in closer and closer to where he is, and he's starting to realize, look, I could be here this moment and in eternity in the next, and therefore I got to take a stand while there's yet time, and he pushes the button, he hits send, and he's enveloped in this cloud of controversy. I bring that up because, first of all, it's in revolutionary, and it's a very fascinating story, but I think it underscores just how dangerous a theory intelligent design is perceived to be. Whereas, in reality, it seems to me that intelligent design doesn't start with presuppositions. It doesn't even start with theistic presuppositions. It's simply following truth wherever it leads. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with that. Yeah, uh, yeah Scott uh, Minnick, he's, he's a microbiologist, and, and he actually 
does experiments on the bacterial flagella. Me, I just write about this stuff and, and read about it and, and interpret it and so on. But he, he does uh, experiments, and he says, yeah, if you knock out any of these genes for the flagellum, it doesn't work anymore. So it's irreducibly complex, like the mouse trap, only, you know, 100 times more uh, complicated. And, yeah, as, as you say, uh, you, you <laughs> if you're in the sciences, if you're in academia or uh, public role, it's you cannot say casually that, well, yeah, I, I think there is something to this intelligent design stuff. Maybe we should think about it for a while. Uh, that is potentially a career-ending move. And Scott, unfortunately, has had trouble at his university uh, where people made anonymous complaints about him to the university administration and they issued statements against anybody talking about intelligent design to poor vulnerable students. And yet Scott and, and me, uh, we've gotten off relatively lightly. There have been other folks uh, who uh, are pursuing intelligent design who have in fact been fired or uh, not hired for positions they were eligible for or harassed into leaving or uh, had their careers uh, decimated. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is being resisted, you know, hammer and tong. Uh, and its only uh, explanation is that this is a fundamental principle that uh, is supporting some one uh, one view versus another, and, and uh, people who are resisting it will not uh, listen to uh, arguments on on the topic. Um, it's it's a shame, but yeah, that's that's the case. And and as you mentioned too, that it's you know it's not that you have to be a Christian or even a theist to uh, think intelligent design is a good explanation. Uh, intelligent design has become a more compelling explanation the more we know about the cell, not the less we know. Back in Darwin's day when the cell was thought to be a piece of jelly, or even back in the 1940s and 50s before we knew about uh, many of the things what we know now, it was a whole lot easier to think that uh, Darwin's theory might be true. It's been the advance of science itself, the uh, the many parts that are required for uh, molecular machinery to uh, function, the great amount of control and regulation that's needed, and all the information that's uh, required to be uh, be uh, stored in in DNA, it's been all of those you know scientific, purely secular scientific discoveries that have. Uh, driven the case for intelligent design. I want to kind of circle back to this a little later on, but we've been talking about the flagellum, and for a lot of people, they don't know what that is, but they're pretty sure they don't want it. Uh, <laughs> kind of explain to the audience, as you're so capable of doing, on a lay level, how the analogy of an outboard motor serves to explain what the flagellum is and why it's significant. Sure. Uh, one thing to start with is that, yeah, uh, a lot of bacteria have this apparatus called the flagellum, which they use to propel themselves through water. And essentially, it's a, like a hair sticking out of the bacterial membrane, and it rotates rapidly, and it acts as a propeller and pushes the bug forward. And, and that's what it looked like, say, in the 19th century when it was first discovered, people saw this little hair uh, out, coming out of a bacterial cell and rotating, and they didn't think much of it. Heck, it's just a little hair. Uh, but it turns out that uh, it's not analogous to an outboard motor. It, it is an outboard motor. It's a machine. And startlingly, uh, I think it's been the greatest accomplishment of biological science in the 20th century that it has discovered that life is based on machines, literally molecular machines in your cell. There are machines like the flagellum that can rotate and are mechanical systems. They could push something forward like the bacterial cell. There are other 
uh, machines in our cells that act like trucks and buses to carry supplies from one side of the cell to the other. There are other systems that act as foremen and regulators that make things go at the right time and turn things off at the right time. And just like the machines in our everyday life, like an outboard motor, these things need multiple parts uh, to work. Uh, if a an outboard motor, if you took off the the propeller, it wouldn't work very well. If you took off the part, the uh, drive shaft that the propeller is bolted to, again, it wouldn't work. If you took out some of the motor, uh, you wouldn't have a an outboard motor. And so, just like machinery. Um, in our everyday world, these things can't be built in the gradual way that Darwin proposed. And these things are even more, much more complicated than uh, similar machines in our, in our everyday life. The, the, um, uh, an outboard motor is pretty fancy and, you know, it's impressive and we wouldn't think that it was likely to be put together by accident. But suppose you had all the pieces of an outboard motor, you know, in a box or something. And you took it out and you opened up the box and you uh, dumped all the pieces onto the garage floor and there was a little tremoring and pieces started to move and it all assembled itself into a functioning outboard motor. That's what molecular machines do. Not only do they have to work, but they have to put themselves uh, together. and so, like I say, the um, principal problem with Darwin's theory is that science has advanced so tremendously, it's simply uh, kind of laughable at trying to think of how it could explain something like this. It just has this one crude mechanism, you know, if something helps a little bit, then it'll, uh, it will increase. But uh, that might explain some things, as I said. But uh, such sophisticated things as, you know, computers, the computing activity of gene systems in the cell, and uh, motor activities like the flagellum, and and chemical factories like the mitochondria, and so on. Uh, it's it's uh, it's really kind of ludicrous to think it could explain that. Another thing I wanted to kind of broach with you, and uh, maybe have a little conversation about, is. The fact that you have a spiritual component to your life as well as a scientific component to your life. And there are a lot of dichotomaniacs out there that think that if you're a scientist, you cannot at the same time exercise the spiritual aspect of your humanity because the two are simply incompatible. Talk about the dysfunctional notion that faith and reason are not compatible. Yeah, it's really silly to think that. I mean, somebody who says that uh, simply has no um, knowledge of the history of science, because many of the greatest scientists in history uh, were, in fact, Christians, were uh, practicing Christians, and matter of fact, got into science because they wanted to study God's creation. Uh, One a uh, particularly prominent scientist was a guy named James Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell, who was the greatest physicist of his age and a very, very uh, devout Christian. Uh, and uh, historians of science have also uh, written and shown that science as an institution has uh, grown up in only one culture, and that was in Western Europe, which was thoroughly Christian at the time. And they said that the reason, uh, to the extent that one can uh, determine reasons for historical events, is that uh, in a Christian culture, uh, people, including scientists, had faith in a law-governed universe, that it wasn't capricious, that you know, things didn't just happen and, you know, next time they'd do something different. Uh, it was that the universe was established by a rational being, supreme rational being, God, uh, who uh, gave it order, and the order attested to God. Uh, we're kind of seeing that come apart in science and, and other places these days where people no longer believe there's a 
the rational basis to the universe. And that has uh, given rise to some really strange proposals uh, over the past few decades, such as uh, something called a Boltzmann brain, where uh, the idea is that brains just kind of pop up in the universe spontaneously, and uh, along with false memories and false understandings of their surroundings. And, and another good one is that we live in a computer simulation where somebody somewhere uh, has a, a big uh, computer, probably an Apple, not a, an IBM, but uh, who is running a simulation, and we are the simulation. So those are folks who have lost the foundation of thought, the foundation of science, and that is that uh, that the universe was established uh, by a rational being and given laws, and that it is fruitful to investigate the universe, to uh, delve into it, as science does, to see what essentially uh, how it has been uh, set up, how it has been rationally set up. Um, in my opinion, it's it's a mark of somebody who hasn't read very much to say that uh, science can't be practiced by somebody who has a, a very strong faith, because that's just historically uh, incorrect. And if you look at the trends in modern science, you can you can see the opposite, that, in fact, when you lose your faith in a rational universe, uh, in a created universe, then you start to go off the rails. Fair enough, Mike Behe, uh, Dr. Behe is, well, he's a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He's a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. He, of course, is the famed author of Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution, but more for my purposes, Revolutionary, which we would love to put in your hands. It's available for anybody who supports the Christian Research Institute. You can just check it out on the web at equip.org. But this DVD, this film, it tells the story of Mike Behe's transformation from well, this mild-mannered biochemist to orthodoxy-challenging revolutionary through the publication of his path-breaking book that challenges Darwinian evolution. Of course, we talked about that. It's titled Darwin's Black Box. But it also explores the rise of the broader intelligent design movement in biology and the attempt to silence supporters of intelligent design in federal court, and the eventual vindication of the ideas of Behe and others during the last decade, revolutionary. It's an absolutely phenomenal film. It's a must-see, and I don't think there's anybody on the planet that shouldn't have this in their library, that shouldn't be watching films like this. It will do a lot to educate you, but I think, Mike, something even beyond that, I think the average person sees a scientist in a certain way. It's sort of like, I now have mental cell lymphoma, so I'm always seeing my doctor, and you look at the doctor and you think that the doctor walks into the doctor's office every single day with a white lab coat on. In other words, they don't have any presuppositions, but they do. They have biases. They're human beings. And I think that underscores the fact that there are stakeholder interests in the university, just as there are in any other field of endeavor. And those stakeholder interests are just as virulent in the sciences as they are in the humanities. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it, it seems to be the case, at least when you touch on uh, topics that are verboten. Uh, we all read stories about the humanities and how they've unfortunately kind of uh, gotten pretty, uh, you know, uh, restrictive in what they will allow in their departments. Uh, in science, you know, I'm I'm a scientist. I'm still a mild-mannered biochemist, uh, but I it's just that I you know looked at the data and I said, hey, you know, it, that doesn't look like it'll work. It, it seems like you know design is a better explanation. And uh, people who say that that kind of get jumped on with both feet. It, it the uh, reaction against it is a whole lot more uh, a 
a whole lot stronger than you'd expect just from the the argument that was made. You'd say, well, you know, that's <laughs> you can say, oh, you know, that's interesting, uh, but I I don't agree, or that's interesting. Well, maybe we'll we'll check it out later. But but people say you can't say that. You know, don't say that. That's that's irrational. That's that's you know you you are uh, undermining the foundation of Western civilization and <laughs> all sorts of, of crazy uh, stuff like that. Um, but, um, yeah, it just goes to show that, you know, we're all just people here, and we've all got hopes and dreams, and we all have prejudices about what we want to be true and uh, what we don't want to be true. And uh, when somebody says something that touches on that it's kind of like if a dentist takes you know a probe and touches on a, a decaying tooth or something like that you could jump out of the chair it could cause so much pain um and so scientists aren't you know like mr spock uh they're uh they're just normal human beings with their their own uh hopes and desires and prejudices and uh to the extent that they let them influence their judgments in science, then, you know, that uh, leads us all astray. You know, this idea of shoddy research must drive you crazy as well. And this is done in the university, in the academic circles, just as it is done in many other circles as well. I remember when I was writing a book called The Millennium Bug Debugged, uh, one of the things I talked about was sloppy journalism, sensationalism, sophistry, even script torture. I coined the word for the occasion, but people mind the subject of the cultivate the seed of threat buried in each unrealized instance, and they come up with this this scenario that doesn't necessarily correspond to reality, but it does sort of fit the cultural narrative at a given point in time. And I bring up this shoddy research idea because the shoddy research comes out of the universities and then it's repeated by journalists and pretty soon it's considered to be fact. And people walk lockstep along with those facts. And And I love this part of revolutionary. Uh, there's an example of Kenneth Miller, a biology professor of Brown University. And he takes your arguments and he misrepresents them and he does it in such a dogmatic way that you think, oh, yeah, if you don't know the facts, you think, yep, B. He has just been thrown under the bus. What he said never made any sense to begin with. Right. Yeah, that, that's, uh, uh, that's what you call a straw man. <laughs> and it's, it's helpful for somebody uh, to take an argument which, uh, on its face, has some merit, and then change it around so that it's brittle and and silly, and then say, uh, you know, this is this is a silly argument, and then everybody dismisses without reading the original stuff. And uh, Ken Miller uh, changed my definition of irreducible complexity, uh, and uh, without getting too didactic here it's it's just that if you take away a part of the system then the system breaks so if you take away a uh the holding bar the uh the piece of metal that keeps the hammer back under tension uh before the mouse comes if you take that away uh the trap doesn't work or if you take away the spring the trap doesn't work and he said uh no no he said Actually, irreducible complexity means that if you take that piece away, the piece can't be used for anything else, anything else. But I can use the uh, the little hammer, which is kind of a U-shaped thing. I can use it to hold my keys, and I can I can use the platform. I can I can use it as a paperweight to weigh down my you know the papers on my desk, and you know that is. Well, that is incorrect, uh, and it's a, a straw man. But nonetheless, in uh, the kind of uh, overheated atmosphere, especially back in the mid 2000s when this trial was going on, that uh, that the DVD revolutionary talks about in, in Dover, Pennsylvania. Back in that time, the friends of Darwin in the media broadcast Ken Miller's. Uh, adulterated definition pretty far and wide 
uh, and it's it's uh, quite a task to try and uh, correct the impressions of so many people that that in fact uh, the argument is is as uh, simple-minded as he tried to make it out to be. Sort of paraphrasing Mark Twain, internet lies travel halfway around the world before truth has had the chance to put its boots on. You know, there's another example of this, and this is sort of the cultural agenda idea, but you have a judge in the Dover case, and you might want to talk a little bit about the Dover case, but he becomes this cultural hero, and this is a judge that decides to watch the 1960 film Inherit the Wind to supply him with some historical context on the case that he's judging, which, of course, for those that do not know, was a highly fictionalized telling of the Scopes monkey trial back in the 1920s, which presents Christians as bigoted fundamentalists and scientists as open-minded people. So it really skews the... uh, the picture substantially. But then he uses material from the ACLU to cobble together a legal opinion, and (laughs) he doesn't even check his sources, which is to say that the errors in the sources become errors in his legal opinion. And even despite all of that, he's lauded by the New York Times and Time Magazine. He's on the cover of Time as one of the world's most influential people in the category of scientists and thinkers. And so you have this real incentive to try to dispel anything that upsets the apple cart, because if you do this, then you have the opportunity to become like a cult hero in society. And there are a lot of accolades that are thrown your way, even though what you did was pretty shoddy to begin with. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, It turns out that Judge John Jones is his name. Uh, He was lionized for his ruling, as you say. He was on the, uh, his face was on the cover of uh, Time magazine. He was given awards by various scientific societies and uh, hailed as a hero. Uh, He was given an honorary degree from his alma mater, Dickinson Law School, where I think he was an English major uh, as an undergraduate, um, all for his ruling the right way. And it it turns out that if you look at the ruling, Uh, Now, I I didn't know anything about uh, legal stuff before this trial, still don't know much, but it turns out that after a trial is ended, but before the judge rules, both sides give him a detailed document on how they want him to rule. And if you look at Jones's opinion, every time it uh, addresses intelligent design, and actually every time it addresses any topic, academic topic, raised by the uh, expert witnesses at the trial, um, whether it was theology or geology or biochemistry or or, um, philosophy, he simply lifted the text that was written by the ACLU and and, uh, undoubtedly the the Darwin boosters that they uh, uh, had as consultants. Uh, There is no uh, evidence, nothing you can point to, to show that this fellow, the English major, the judge, uh, who was also the the head of the Liquor Control Board Agency in Pennsylvania before he became a judge, uh, there is no evidence to show that he even comprehended any of the academic arguments uh, that were presented in the courtroom. You know, when he, in his opinion, discussed... Uh, topics like newspaper editorials and school board meetings, he used his own writing. He he wrote for himself. But when he discussed any academic topic, he simply copied uh, what was given to him. And if you read it, I probably don't have time to go into it. There are a number of mistakes and uh, misattributions to me uh, that uh, show that essentially he wasn't thinking for himself. He was essentially taking the word of the um, scientific community uh, that Darwin's theory was correct. But uh, whether the scientific community was right or wrong was exactly what was, you know, under discussion. Uh, And so uh, people who 
declared him a philosopher king, which uh, a lot of people did back back then, uh, were really uh, being taken in. I don't know what your position is on global warming, but I remember reading an article by Dr. Jay Richards, and he was teaching people how to ask the right questions and ask those questions in the right sequence. But ultimately, he was arguing against this whole idea of scientific consensus just because a whole lot of scientists say something is true doesn't make it so. And we can often go off the cliff if we don't ask the right questions in the right sequence. For example, if, in fact, we spend tens of trillions of dollars of the global economy on something that really can't be dealt with in an effective way, those tens of trillions of dollars can't be used for other purposes because money is not ubiquitous. So by contrast, for $200 billion, and I was just getting a transfusion in the hospital this morning talking to a doctor about this, for $200 billion, you can provide clean water to everyone on the planet that doesn't have it. So there are, I suppose in this sense, whatever your opinion is, there are uh, consequences to ideas. Oh, absolutely. And people who think that scientific consensus uh, is a is a um, stand-in for truth. Uh, how how does one explain then that you know almost all scientific theories get overthrown? You know, back back a uh, hundred years, hundred and fifty years ago, most scientists thought that the universe was eternal and unchanging, uh, and then uh, observations came along that galaxies seemed to be moving apart from each other as if in the aftermath of a giant explosion. And now the whole scientific community thinks that the, that the universe had a beginning in time and that it's not static like people thought back then. Um, Newton's theory reigned for a long time and was upset by Einstein's uh, theory of gravity. And so a person who says our consensus you know, simply has to be true without addressing arguments that are against it. Uh, they are they are essentially being uh, anti-intellectual. I want to get to a couple more questions before we end this podcast. One, I think it's very, very important for people to hear the people that are listening in to get your opinion on, and I think this is transcendently important, in that today in the universities, it doesn't seem like you have the latitude oftentimes for the free exchange of ideas. There's sort of this lockstep mentality. People are protesting things they'd never read before. You're an academic. You work in the academic environment. You're a scientist. How dangerous is this? this notion that we're, we're going to pontificate as opposed to allowing people to think and then allowing the best ideas to win out in the end? Yeah, well, uh, I think it's very dangerous, and I, I don't study it at all, but uh, uh, from my perspective, it, it's a very big problem uh, because uh, in these days of the Internet and, and other media, it turns out that a person's conversation with somebody else uh, is not oftentimes, you know, private or uh, localized, but it can be broadcast over the whole world in a very, very short time. And people who have um, access to Grind uh, can use electronic means to quickly get a uh, a mob together, pretty much, uh, and hound people who say the wrong things. And, and that's not only in um, in academia, too. It's it's in other things, in politics as well. So I, I think that's a large part of it. There are certainly other things, too, but I, you know, I just think the, uh, the ability to communicate in large groups very quickly is quite the double-edged sword. It enforces orthodoxy uh, much more than it enlightens people. Uh, but I, I can see the problem, but I, I don't have an answer uh, for it. 
The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is on a more personal level, uh, you, your children, your family, I mean, your the DVD revolution era gets into this a little bit. You are a family man. You've got nine kids. And as the father of a large family myself, I'm always concerned that my kids uh, understand how to operate effectively in the world in which they are, not be cultural imitators, but cultural initiators, cultural change agents. In the film, you're shown with your kids, you're shown to be a regular guy. And I I mean, you are a regular guy. I'm a regular guy. But a lot of people don't see public figures in that way. Talk about the significance of your role as a father, as well as the significance of your role as a scientist. Well, um, of course, as as a dad, uh, as you know, you've got very, very specific responsibilities for very, very specific people, your kids. Uh, it's not uh, not the case as you know when you in your job, even whatever job you have, the you might have responsibility for a, a lot of people, but at a you know much more diffuse or uh, higher level. Uh, you're not feeding them and clothing them and telling them, you know, leading them to understand what's right and wrong. Uh, so uh, both of those things have to, you know, weigh on your on your mind, on your conscience. And, uh, of course, uh, I am uh, the kind of guy who says that the obligations for your kids and for your family uh, take precedence uh, o- over pretty much anything else. Uh, and yeah, you. Everybody has to worry. Every dad, every mom, has to worry these days about uh, how their kids are uh, reacting to the culture, which is changing so quickly and uh, becoming so alien to what uh, we uh, experienced as kids. And you try to do as best you can, uh, but you know the culture itself. We homeschool. Uh, we don't have a TV. Uh, we do watch videos and stuff like that. We don't, but we don't have a you know cha- uh, cable or anything like that. And yet the culture still finds its way in, and uh, and not to any, not to a, a good effect either. So uh, you've all just got to be vigilant. Uh, read as much as you can about the the best way to ad- uh, address uh, this changing world on 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 your kids and. And pray, <laughs> pray as as uh, as much as you can. The slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. Talking about prayer, you are, as I perceive it, in every way the same person you were before fame found you. You are a reluctant person in the spotlight. But yet you exemplify what I would call the power of one, one person that is put in a particular situation that asks the crucial question at the right time, catapults a revolution. And that's really what this revolutionary is all about, isn't it? Yeah, I I think you're right. I mean, uh, to me, it, it seems, you know, absurd uh, that, you know, people look upon this idea or me as, you know, either this genius or this idiot, uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, the ideas are pretty simple when you see all this elegance in, in the foundation of life. It uh, just to say, hey, you know, hey, that looks like it's designed, and and here's why, you know, it's not a big deal, uh, and yet it is, uh, you know, these social factors which suppress it. Oh, we, you know, we don't talk about that, uh, and not even so much explicit rules, just uh, social customs and what faces people make if you start to talk about design and God and, and so on in, in secular places, uh, that touches a nerve. And, and many people just aren't in, as we said earlier, in the position to be able to question science about these things because they aren't scientifically trained. Uh, and other people just, uh, because of the social conditions, just 
go along with the flow or don't have the opportunity or uh, to question uh, these basic assumptions of our uh, society. But uh, when you do and when you point it out and when through some mistake uh, the culture allows your voice to be heard as I guess mine was when my book was published by a, a large New York publishing house, uh, then uh, even just that one person, one voice, can have a big effect if if it's taken up, of course, by, by many other people when they hear about it. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, you know, it's what they say is, is true. One person can have an effect, but, of course, it's, it's through the work of other people, uh, through the other the work of other people, too. Well, you are an extraordinarily humble man that is evident in not only this conversation, but evident in the film Revolutionary. It's evident in all of your public engagements, and I think this is one of the marks of a truly great person, recognizing that we are what we are by the grace of God, nothing more, nothing less, that God puts us in the right circumstance at the right moment, and then we do our part as unto Him. We only have one life, and soon it will be passed, and only what ultimately done for the city of God is going to last. We live in the city of man, but ultimately we're focused on the city of God. I think your genius has been to take the complex and make it simple and transferable, and I think that's why there has been such a great outrage against your books and ideas, because you're communicating with the common person, and when you communicate with the common person, person, you take those things that are big words and you boil them down to something that we can relate to, then you become a threat. So you have become a threat in many ways, but a transformational agent in the end. And Mike, I appreciate your work. I've known about you for years and I've I've wanted to have you on this podcast so other people get to know you better as well. So thanks for the conversation. Yeah, it's been grand. Uh, ask me back anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take you up on that. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining Dr. B, he and myself for another episode of Hank Unplugged. And remember, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to give us a rating on iTunes and share this with your friends. Or it doesn't have to be iTunes, wherever you consume your favorite podcast, but more podcasts coming your way. And I think this is another grand example of the promise that I'm going to bring some of the most interesting, fascinating, brilliant people to your hearing. That's what we do on Hank Unplugged, and this was no exception. So my thanks to Dr. Michael Behe, and I look forward to seeing you on another episode of Hank Unplugged.